them. So I guess, well, first I'll start with the poster, which obviously I'm sorry, I wrote it, that's one kind of small. But I do this a lot of like, um, just bigger sized flow charts. And um, I guess the long and short of the flow chart is that I think it can, you can teach your brain to think about like six things at once. <laughs> Totally sober. <laughs> <laughs> totally, yeah. So, um, so I will kind of. I guess it's like when you get to the outer rooms, that's when sort of serious thinking happens, or when like you can't think to add a point to something anymore, then it's done. And if you ever have to write reviews or essays, I find this completely helpful because then your essay is almost done. I just put this in front of the computer and then I'm, I'm done. And I always put my quotes, I've got like everything done. So I get to do it's that in PhD dollars. school. Mm -hmm. it, uh, is it directional? <laughs> Does it start? So Is there like it a starts yeah. here oh, okay. at Fuck You Peter Pan. <laughs> 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 um, and then I got caught in some places, like I usually try to let it um, flower out, but I've seen others, and then you, it can get complicated if you do two lines or, you know, and I think Microsoft maybe has a program where you can do it on the computer, but I think there is something about doing that kind of paper and making spelling mistakes and everything. Um, so I'm going to be talking from this, but um, I was reading the New York Review of Books and I came across this, what I thought was an interesting review of a new annotated Peter Pan. And I had never read it as a child, but I had seen the cartoon and I just, I don't know, I just always had like good associations with it. But after reading this, I wanted to read the book, and I felt so angry after reading it, and angry at the way that women, the four, all four of them, um, are depicted in the book. So, just to give you a refresher on Peter Pan, and this, the, um, if I quote from this, is from Alison Murray. And one note about her was, I thought she was like a young woman, or maybe someone my age. Mm -hmm. um, but it turns out she's 85, born in 1926, so she's around my grandparents' age. And, um, and yeah, so I don't know why I would have assumed she was young, she chose to write about Peter Pan, but she's not. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, the central facts about Peter Pan are as follows. He is a charming, charismatic child who wants always to be a little boy and have fun and gets his wish. He can fly and teach other children how to fly, and he lives on an island called Neverland that combines the landscapes of contemporary British children's fantasies and games. There he is the captain of a group of lost boys whom he leads on thrilling adventures with pirates, Indians, mermaids, fairies, and wild beasts. But he longs for a mother and manages to entice a little girl called Wendy to leave her home in London and follow him with her two brothers to Neverland. So that's him. I'm going to... I'll be referring back to that. Um, so one major point that that I hit upon after writing this was um, that I, I couldn't read it without feminist tendencies, or I, could, I couldn't read it and be angry. And then so my question was, is an adventure story an adventure story, or are action movies just action movies? Is the thing just the thing, or is it more complicated than that? And I, I think it is. Um, and after I had read this review, I got pregnant. <laughs> and then I've been thinking about, well, would I read this book to my son? And I don't think so. <laughs> but um, the flip question, I guess, would be, like, can you, uh, can you appreciate something that's been taught to you as a classic, um, that has, you know, racist under overtones or, you know, whatever. <coughs> that, that's the flip, the flip question, I guess, that I came up with. Um, so, sorry, I'm putting this in your face. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I said it was difficult for me not to think, of, think about this with feminist leanings because Wendy, the character, there are no expectations for her other than that she's going to grow up and get married and have babies. Um, so she kind of plays the role of this little mother. Um, 
but thinking about that and coming to the title, All Are Implicated, I was thinking, well, what does this thing say about men? And the author, J.M. Barry, um, supposedly never consummated his marriage with his wife, was very unhappy, and met these four boys, the Llewellyn Davies boys, who he befriended and made up these stories about Peter Pan, too, in which he always played Captain Hook, which I thought was kind of weird. <laughs> um, but I just kind of wonder, because he was a very stiff Victorian man, I almost wonder, was he in the closet, or, it, I mean, if different, if things were different, what what would have come out that, that we could know about him? But, so he just, he was married and childless and very unhappy. Um, so, but the question is, what, what does this sort of thing say about men? Um, and I had this question of, are, are men allowed to, are more allowed to be Peter Pan than women? And I was thinking a lot about like slacker comedies, like Knocked Up and that kind of thing, um, where 20 something, 20 to 30 something men are doing everything they can to avoid growing up and having responsibility. And I think only recently, women have begun playing this role like in Bridesmaids, um, so it's, it's kind of strange that I wondered um, what, what was the saying about our humor and is humor itself being de-intellectualized because you don't have people like in Woody Allen films who are educated. Um, um, I wrote well-educated adulterers <laughs> <laughs> um, versus, you know, the new movies of now, the wayward, kind of wayward children children who don't want to grow up. Um, Peter Pan started as a play and was commonly played by a young athletic girl. And this was Mia, one of Mia Farrow's first like breakout roles. And I don't know if like Woody Allen would have been in the audience when <laughs> she was playing Peter Pan, but it really, it, um, it was usually commonly played by a woman, or by a young girl. Um, and there used to be, like, the Lost Boys were often played by young girls also. But um, Alison Lurie talks about in her article the aging of Peter Pan in movies like Hook and um, the recent one with Johnny Depp, that the people who are playing Peter Pan are a lot older. And even Disney, like, went on a stretch with their Peter Pan because his voice was kind of cracking. He was, like, a prepubescent. Um, whereas I think J.M. Barry pictured Peter Pan as like a six-year-old or someone like really little. Um, Peter Pan has all of his baby teeth. <laughs> he often forgets things and sort of lives in the present. So um, present. So even though he brings Wendy and her brothers to Neverland, he often forgets the name of her brothers. He, Wendy does things for Peter Pan and he immediately takes credit for it because he can't even remember that she just did something for him. <laughs> um, so, and I think there was one psychologist who named it a, a syndrome after him of like men who are kind of stuck in adolescence, um, the Peter Pan syndrome, which I think a lot of more women are too. But, um, so going with the book, there are four only four women, and there's the obvious paradigm of like the mother and the whore, and the mother is played by, or is Wendy, and um, Peter Pan has taken her to take care of them. And um, the funny thing about Captain Hook, which I think is strange that adults live in Neverland, I think like my Neverland would be like no adult, um, but the thing about Captain Hook was he always thought he could outwit Peter Pan because Peter Pan doesn't have a mother. And there's certain things about Peter Pan, like um, there's not a door on his house, and Captain Hook knows like anybody who has a mother would have a door on their house. And he, <laughs> wa he wants to kill Peter Pan by making this super sweet cake because anybody who have a mother, would their mother would tell them not to eat the too rich of a cake. <laughs> but the boys don't have a mother, so they're all gonna die. Mm -hmm. But so when he, when Captain Hook finds out that Peter Pan gets Wendy, the mother, then he wants Wendy to be his mother. <laughs> so everybody, <laughs> <laughs> her. 
So she's, that's like the closest he gets to sex in this book, um, which is about children. I find it odd because I think they're so like, violent and sexual. But, <laughs> um, so Tiger Lily kind of gets, gets the only sex here. And um, <laughs> Wendy's mother, Mrs. Darling, is being a mother to Mr. Darling so much so that her children go missing. Um, she leaves her children with a nurse. They even have a housekeeper, but they leave their children with a dog. <laughs> um, not recommended. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the father is such a child. He's kind of like the character foil to Peter Pan. He's such a child that when the children go missing, he was the one who let the dog out. So to punish himself, he, go he leaves and he leaves and returns from work in a dog kennel so like everyone could see like the terrible thing he had done it's pretty bizarre um and i had one more kind of other point oh yeah one point i kept thinking about i had a really hard time um, thinking about uh, adventure books that have female leads. Mm -hmm. So there's Dorothy, Alice, um, you know, and maybe the, maybe a few others, but, um, and Alice and Lori pointed this out also, but that female leads almost always want to go home. Mm -hmm. That's always their goal, is to go home. Or, like, um, I was thinking sort of the ultimate female lead is Buffy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my posters always get to Buffy. <laughs> um, but she's the ultimate female lead, but um, it is weird because she, she struggles really hard. She, the only, she really wants to be a normal girl, and she can't do it alone. Like, she can't do it without her friends, which is different than the male adventure of, like, being alone, I guess. And that, it was, that's what I was thinking. I couldn't... I would guess a, a male counterpart to Buffy maybe would be James Bond because he always has to seduce people into like <laughs> helping him, or you know the government helps him I guess. But um, that was the only one I could think of of someone who's kind of alone but yet with others. Um, oh, and so thinking about they're not being able or they're not being adventure stories with female leads. Alice and Lurie pointed out um, success, and su su success now means something totally different for, for a woman. It's not better, it's just different in that a successful woman has autonomy and power, and you could have a nice house, a car, and you all the clothes you want, and therefore maybe the partner you want, and getting out of the hetero norm of, of thinking of, you know, in the same sex couple, a really successful woman is a great catch, right? I, I mean, I would assume so. <laughs> um, but that, in the, I don't know. So success is something different for women. So to be lost in Neverland then isn't as interesting for a female reader. To not, not want to go home and not go see Auntie Anne and Uncle Henry or whatever. So I just wanted to read a piece from her because I thought that, that this was really interesting. Um, there, are no, there are no lost girls in Neverland. Barry explains this by telling us that the lost boys were all babies who fell out of their perambulators and that the girls were always too clever to do any such thing. <laughs> Today, perhaps, for a similar reason, there are few female slacker films. Women in popular culture are often shown as upset and depressed by the idea of growing old, usually because age will make them less attractive to men, but they seldom seem to long for a permanent adolescence in which they hang out with other lazy, unemployed females, get drunk, and talk dirty. Why talk dirty? Um, usually they want the traditional perks of successful adulthood good jobs and expensive clothes and attractive lovers and husbands. Possibly after being treated as irresponsible children for so many years, and she doesn't explain this, I, I would assume it's something about girls being taught they have to be sweet and nice or whatever. Um, possibly after being treated as irresponsible children for so many years, they have 
No desire for that role while men with a long history of pressure to grow up and take responsibility are still dreaming of escape into perpetual youth. And what I like about this is that I think it does show empathy for these slacker films that like like knocked up or anything by Joe Apatow really that I criticize a lot, but I think there's this empathy there because I think men do get a lot of pressure to like grow up and be successful. Please mom, please your wife, your partner, whatever. So I kind of liked I kind of liked how she said this. I guess I'm just gonna end. I was gonna read a little bit of Peter Pan <laughs> in case you didn't um, read it when you were little. Um, and this is the part where Peter Pan has flown into Wendy's window and he's lost his shadow. And Tink is Tinkerbell. That's her nickname. And I kept thinking like Tink for Pink because she's so like. <laughs> Tim said that the shadow was in the big box. She meant the chest of drawers, and Peter jumped at the drawers, scattering their contents to the floor with both hands as King's toss happens to the crowd. In a moment, he had recovered his shadow, and in his delight, he forgot that he had shut Tinkerbell up in the drawer. If he thought at all, but I don't believe he ever thought, it was that he and his shadow, when brought near to each other, would join like drops of water, and when they did not, he was appalled. He tried to stick it on with soap from the bathroom, but that also failed. A shudder passed through Peter, and he sat on the floor and cried. His sobs woke Wendy, and she sat up in bed. She was not alarmed to see a stranger crying on the nursery floor. She was only pleasantly interested. <laughs> Boy, she said with curiosity, why are you crying? Peter could be exceedingly polite also, having learned the grand manner at fairy ceremonies, and he rose and bowed to her beautifully. She was much pleased, and bowed beautifully to him from the bed. What's your name? he asked. Wendy Moriah Angela Darling, she replied with some satisfaction. What is your name? Peter Pan. She was already sure that he must be Peter, but it did seem compared a comparatively short name. Is that all? Yes, he said rather sharply. He felt for the first time that it was a shortish, shortish name. And there's a little picture of Tinkerbell and Peter Pan. <laughs> the six-year-old version of Peter Pan. I'm so sorry, said Wendy, Mariah, and Jella. It doesn't matter, Peter gulped. She asked where he lived. Second to the right, said Peter, and then straight on till morning. What a funny address. Peter had a sinking. For the first time, he felt that perhaps it was a funny address. No, it isn't, he said. I mean, Wendy said nicely, remembering that she was hostess. Is that what they put on letters? He wished he had not, she had not mentioned letters. Don't get any letters, he said contemptuous, <laughs> contemptuously. But your mother gets letters? Don't have a mother, he said. Not only had he had, had he no mother, but he had not the slightest desire to have one. He thought them very overrated persons. Wendy, however, felt at once that she was in the presence of a tragedy. So I'm going to stop there. <laughs> um, and one last point I want to make is a point about Neverland and how I think, like, J.M. Berry's imagination just fell. Like, my Neverland is like orgies everywhere, cupcakes, like <laughs> everything you want all the time. And Neverland in Peter Pan is um, a pure struggle for survival. So the boys have to fight against um, pir pirates who are adults, and I don't know how they get into Neverland if other adults can't. Um, mermaids, which I think, what could be more sexless than a mermaid? They have no genitals. That's just weird. Um, <laughs> mermaids, which are, they're vicious and mean, and it kept, it, the book keeps saying they play with the mermaids, but the mermaids are like trying to kill the boys. Um, there are wild beasts, and the beasts are just like hungry and desperate for blood. Um, and the tribal people, um, one of the tribal people is described as carrying so many scalps that he like falls over, that he can't like walk. So that's like the suckiest number. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. <laughs>